So we're going to dive straight into it. Um, will this book, it's fascinating. It's so rich. And I love how concise and compact it is, both to hold in your hands and in terms of your use of language. Um, but before we dive into the characters and the language, I want to talk about the premise itself. So this book is called Roundabout, uh, and it's about a specific roundabout, a specific place, which is the Place Henri Krasuki uh, in the 20th arrondissement of Paris. Uh, and to open this book, you begin with a quote from Georges Perec, uh, from his Species of Spaces, in which he writes, in short, spaces have multiplied, been broken down, and have diversified. There are spaces today of every size and every sort, for every use and every function. To live is to pass from one space to another, while doing your best not to bump into yourself. In the case of Roundabout, why write this book? Why base this book around a place, a space? I chose this space after I had first thought up what I wanted to write, which was a book about a group of friends. And uh, for me, I guess the ideal for a group of friends is, and maybe this is comes from 90s television, is that they always meet at the same place. <laughs> uh, they're reliably present. They never fail to be there. Uh, and so I had the idea for the book, bef but for the, the friendship group meeting at a place first. And then as I started writing, uh, I thought, well, I realized I wanted to put them somewhere. And this roundabout is just a place that I go off and drink beers at a lot and have had a lot of stories uh, from. And so uh, I, I think it was as simple as that. I, I wanted to um, make a place that felt a bit like a theater for a group of friends. And uh, the epigraph that you talked about was in the writing and in researching more about the place once I had just started working there, I found out that that neighborhood is this lost, almost mythic space that where Perret grew up, but then it was leveled uh, to make way for Belleville Park. So as I was working on trying to build out the space in the book, I felt myself very inspired by this, uh, the, the odd history of the place where it's, it's not really there, it's not exactly real, um, and so the place hopefully is a bit unreal when you, when you see how they use it, when you see how the friendship group uses it. You, you do that work of balancing what is real and what is unreal. You do such careful work with that over the space of this book, kind of navigating fiction um, and then navigating the fiction of the fiction. Um, and the choice of the roundabout as well, it's so potent in terms of what this actual roundabout is historically and then in terms of what the roundabout symbolizes, what it signifi signifies, right? It's, it's a circle, it's a cycle, it has many avenues leading out of it and leading into it. Uh, it's a place of motion, but it's also a place of stagnation. One gets stuck in the roundabout and we get the impression that that unreality is produced from, from being stuck in this place that's always moving but never moving at the same time. I um one of the ways I thought about it, and I don't know if people will uh, know the reference in like video games in the early 2000s, they used to have maps that like as you explored, the map would grow, but if you were just looking at the map at a place you'd never been, everything around you was gone. And uh, I kind of thought I, that inspired me as well as I, I, I thought that uh, you know everything that happens in the roundabout is very clear um, but the moment you take a few steps out, you just kind of, you know, pixelate and disappear. And, and uh, so, yeah, for me, that it was a very important to make uh, it feel unreal outside of the space. I love that, too. Um, and, I, and I love, as well, the fact that this space kind of balances that, um, the dynamic of real and unreal, but then also it carries such history with it. And I want to talk a bit about the 20th arrondissement of Paris in general. Um, so this place is Place Henri Krasuki. Henri Krasuki was uh, involved in the Commune de Paris, I believe, um, which was very associated with the 20th arrondissement of Paris. Um, this neighborhood has a history of being both working class and artistic. Um, it's changing a lot right now, and it's a place that you have lived in and written about and worked about um, in many different dimensions. If you could briefly tell us what do we need to know about the 20th to understand its centrality to this book and to your work? Um, 
So uh, Henri Kosugi, he's uh, a unionist, I think, from the late seven, the 50s to the 70s, and uh, which you know it fits for with the whole uh, evolution of you know commu you know the commune, which is where communism comes from, and then you know onwards with. Uh, let's say, labor politics for 200 years. Um, but for me, honestly, it's it's also just the neighborhood that's been uh, my home for 10 years here, basically, more or less. Um, it's a neighborhood, I think, you know, it's it's maybe in this book can, can try and talk a little bit more to it, but it's a mix of a cool neighborhood that is also a, uh, a neighborhood that remains very socialist, very, uh, you know, labor movement, uh, you know, uh, related. Uh, it uh, is a neighborhood that I think has done pretty well to fight back against gentrification. Uh, there's a lot of um, strong political organization within it, so I think that's what's kind of, for me, very interesting is that you see uh, this, these two really op opposing forces. So, you know, uh, the, ra the roundabout has actually just got a really new, very fancy coffee shop, and it's caused so much tension. And you go onto the Google, you know, the Google Maps, and look at the reviews of this po coffee shop, and it's like a political dialogue in the in the yeah. comment <laughs> section. Um, and so that's really fun. Uh, and I would say that, like, you know, that's maybe the the interesting part about it. But for me, it's also just my life here, and uh, I've lived on I think three of the different offshoot roads of this roundabout. I've passed through it all the time. It's, for me, this this roundabout is, one, is a collection place. And, and so, you know, though the 20th is very big and, and this is only a small part of it, there's a lot of roads that funnel into this one space. And so I think that's why uh, it's it's a, a point within a big neighborhood uh, and it collects kind of my, my knowledge of this city. And it's so layered with history, as you said. So there's the history of Georges Perec's life there. There's the history of the Paris Commune. Um, it has a sort of Jewish history that you touch upon here as well um, in relation to World War II. Um, and when one is, is in this neighborhood, you have the sensation of being in historic Paris, of, of wandering these sort of cobbled village streets. It feels untouched by tourism in a sense. Um, and this brings us to a di another focal point of this book. So insofar as it's a book about place, we've got the really specific place, which is the roundabout, the bigger place, which is the 20th. But of course, it's a book about Paris. Um, and there are many dimensions to Paris. There's kind of the lived, real Paris. And then there's the fictional, literary Paris, with Chaz, a very particular legacy as well. I want to talk about the lived, real Paris as well. And I want to briefly talk about your first book, with, with Paris in Mind. I'm hoping you could tell us a bit of what that book was and how that has informed the writing that went into this project. Um, so that book was a collection of interviews with uh, young artists across multiple mediums, uh, all of which who are you know, based in Paris. Uh, and the hope was uh, to try and produce a collection of, of uh, dialogues, interviews that uh, sh showed off what was happening now, you know, where this, where, where uh, s to live in this city is to struggle against being museified. You know, your, 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 everything you do is in relation to the past. And I think, especially after talking to so many people who are filmmakers and writers and artists, and you know, there's no medium that is safe from the fame of you know a hundred years ago or seventy years ago. Um, so I wanted to just do a small you know, a small part in trying to make very clear that there are people here doing very interesting things, that the things they are doing are not just uh, in a small community, that they are, you know, still global, but also still connected to this place where, uh, you know, everyone dreams of coming for that old community. Uh, and then for the book, in the way that it in, um, informs the novel is, is that one of the aspects of the book was to look at the art these people make, but at the same time to discuss, uh, let's say, uh, you know, lowercase mental health. So not particularly uh, diagnosed uh, issues, but uh, just the mental health of the millennial Gen Z generation. Um, and one of the things we focused on a lot in the dialogues was um, loneliness. Uh, and this was, I mean, the book came out uh, three months before COVID. Um, and so 
you know, a funny time to have spent two years thinking about loneliness and talking with 30 people about their different interpretations of loneliness. Um, and that actually, I think, made it played a big part in this book is there is this odd relation that these friends have to their friendship group, to this friendship group, which uh, as you read it and as all the bad things happen to these people and all, all the, you know, the slanders and the slights happen, the friendship group never breaks up. And I think that's a very important thing is that like, I was looking at this loneliness and you know, when I was researching with Paris in mind, loneliness is, uh, I think they found out that like, it's worse for you than smoking two packs of cigarettes a day or something ridiculous like that. Um, and uh, so I wanted to write this book that made people reflect on how they see their friends you know it's a lot of the people's responses to my questions about loneliness in the first book were I have tons of friends and yet I'm very lonely um, and so you know to me it's it's if you're still lonely when you have all you know, a, you know let's say city life or a friend you know a social network or you know people to care about you then for me it was it's a question of how how do you view your friends how do you view the value of the people around you and this book I think is hopefully entirely that it's different uh, different um, uh, opinions on a single friendship group. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's how it, how it relates. I love that you say that the friendship group kind of never breaks up because in a way they form their own roundabout. You know, the circle never breaks. Um, and I want to talk more about this idea of looking at your friends because it's a book about looking and seeing one another but then not quite seeing one another. Um, but before we get to that, I want to I wanna beat the dead horse of Paris a little bit harder. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you talk um, in the sort of uh, publicity about with Paris in mind, you have these very striking lines, you know, dead Hemingway, dead Stein, dead Baldwin. Um, and in fact, you're, you're t you've touched upon the fact that um, Paris has caught in its own roundabout, and that roundabout is Parisian literary history, which happened 100 years ago and then died, and then now we maybe adhere to a sort of fetishization of that history, as opposed to admitting that time has moved forward. Um, and part of that legacy is the neighborhood. You know, it's Latin Quarter, then it's Montparnasse, then it's Montmartre, and you've identified the new living, kind of artistic neighborhood of the present. How did you... How did you balance this legacy and the sort of tropes of the Paris novel and the American and Paris novel? You know, you have the people speaking Franglais, you have the surly barman that everyone knows, you have drinking, you have bad parties, you have the erotics of politics, you have the historic cobblestone streets. Um, did you feel pressure to distance yourself from these tropes of Parisian literary history or did you feel the need to readopt them, infuse them with new life? Um, I guess the easy, the easy way out of a, of a, a good question is, is to say that like, that like, Paris, you know, as people who've lived in Paris know, this city doesn't change visually. It, f it feels like it's, you know, you leave it for a few years, you come back, it's the same visual city. So if you write the setting in the way it is, it will look a lot like 1920s Paris or 1950s Paris. Um, but the way in which people interact with each other and the, I think the, you know, if we take the lost generation and what its literary, uh, um, literary merits are, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, modernism, it's, it's experimenting with a certain sort of form and with especially a certain sort of personality that has just gone through the, the war. Uh, so for me, it's, okay, we have the same theatrical space. I use the roundabout, other people use the, the Latin Quarter. Um, but for me, it's and the way that you know the book is interspersed with these um, these uh, vignettes of like of uh, uh, I guess you know hard political violence, political violence yeah. or you know, urban violence or terrorist violence, and those things are present, but almost as if they are not in the story because they don't appear in the chapters. So for me, that's kind of what we're living right now, which is that. We are these beings who are trying to, you know, stay calm, basically, like fight anxiety, where like the most anxious and scary and uh, and uh, violent things are happening, and so hopefully this book, you know, the to to choose the space is b I live here, I loved it, I came because of of these people from the past, but you know, trying to just tell a story from today, it's 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 the same same place, but with a different sort of 
I guess, uh, uh, struggle or a traumatic uh, driver of your story. And so for me, it's it's uh, the, sacri the Notre Dame burning down, or it's you know the few days after the you know the November thirteenth attacks. It's it's you know trying to stay living a normal life when the news and you know, the ever present uh, stress is sitting right behind you. I want to talk about these vignettes more because they're so striking. Um, it reminded me, so the structure of this book is we hear stories of this group of friends, um, but interspersed throughout are these these moments of political urban violence. As you said, there's Gilets jaunes, um, there's the Notre Dame burning, there's climate change, um, there's the Seine flooding. I think that it would help us if we could hear some of these passages that we could have an understanding of what we're talking about. Um, so I've got two marked for you. I'm hoping if you could do page 33 and page 67. In the spring, the Seine promptly flooded its promenades with water. Yellow was the water and murky too. It matched the spring sky of election season and some of us spoke in documentary voices. One evening, we crossed the river on our way to an election party. From the bridge, we looked down in. There were no answers in the river. It was just pretty in its drawn out, yellow tough question. At the party, Bressons was playing. His music was starting to mean something new. The party had no television, but it had a view onto the tall new build buildings with rows and rows of windows. We listened to the election on the radio, pausing Brissons to listen, some of us watching the living rooms of the buildings we could see into. There were dozens of living rooms, each with their own television making colors. When the results burst in, we watched the living rooms begin churning. Hands were thrown towards the sky, towards God, we guessed, and remote controls were thrown screenward, useless. The apartments with nice decorations looked angry. So too the apartments with no decor at all. Someone said that this was interesting. Someone said they could, uh, they could not understand. We all knew we were not sure. It seemed like everyone we knew wanted the coverage turned off quickly and the Bressons to be turned back on. Only later did our waiter friends who worked at the experimental restaurants say they'd seen anyone remotely happy. They assured us though, the people who were happy were really very happy. They made up for the rest of us. Thick black smoke rose off the church, turning green in the evening. It was pretty, unfortunately, and it had poison in it, we were told later. We had seen the smoke from across the city, just like everyone says you will in fiction. We rushed to it. We paid for metro tickets to get there faster. We grew impatient at how long it was taking. We almost argued even from how badly we wanted to see history. We thought the history might only last a second, but it didn't. When we got there, we moved closer, closer until we were as close as we could get, close enough to breathe in the poison, we were told later. We didn't know we were in danger then because so many people were doing it too, breathing in, watching mesmerized by the white hot triangle in the burning eaves, white in the pink burning evening. The others around us on the Pont de Ternel were just as burning and it made them do funny things too. Some grown men were crying and singing. Some grown women were singing and laughing. Everyone was singing at least and doing a lot of breathing in. Everyone had out their telephones, singing while holding up telephones, divvying up history and taking some of it with them. We did it too with our phones and we sang and no one we ever knew replayed the videos we each took because they were always the same. They never changed. The church just kept on burning. Thank you for reading those. Um, I'm I'm struck by these because, you know, we called this event Paris of the present, and it's because these events are so immediately recognizable of the Paris that we're all living in today. This isn't the Paris from 100 years ago. This is my Paris. This is your Paris. Um, and it's the Paris of the characters, and yet they don't refer to these events, to these political happenings. And so you've chosen, you've chosen to intersperse these vignettes in, but you haven't wo woven them into the narrative itself. And I'm curious and struck by your use of we in these. Who is that we for you? I mean, I think that's, to me, hopefully the fun part for people to decide. <laughs> but at least for me now, or when I was really uh, trying to decide how I wanted to do those vignettes, it's that uh, the way the, f the, the book is structured is that it spins similar to a roundabout where each character gets one paragraph 
per chapter to 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 describe what they're seeing and to describe what's going on and it spins and it spins and it spins and uh and as you said like they don't like at least in the chapters where you witness their life they don't nothing bad happens to them they're protected like i you know i take this the the space to to protect them they're in the roundabout in the it's roundabout. not real exactly yeah. and so they're in this this space where they can avoid the reality of of contemporary life so um i think yeah i think uh for me to 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 get to the we it's it's that if you just speed that up for a whole life as it as it churns and you know, your friendship group becomes you know, the longer you're with them and that's something that i've noticed here in in paris is that i have friends who i've had at various points but they're not my friends forever we change we go to college we we you know love the people then but then we never talk to them again and it's this funny thing as an american we we're so transient and here friendship groups stay together forever i find them very inspiring they they do the t worst things to one another and yet they're best friends uh and so i kind of wanted that that whole idea of what a friendship group could be here to be the we uh at least at least sort of in those moments it's it's you know hopefully none of these care hopefully uh, everyone will like all the characters I, I, I hope that no one has a favorite character because to me that would be a failure of what i was trying to do with it is that the we is 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 the how these people fit together it's 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 the roundabout it's the circle itself and the circle doesn't have a center it's it's just the circle um i'm s i'm struck by what you said about kind of nothing can happen to these characters because things do happen to them but not in the space of the page um it reminds me of something out of out of wolf where you know mrs ramsey dies off off page it's the 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 tragedy always arises from outside of um outside of the text itself. And I want to talk um, in that vein more about your use of the multiple characters itself uh, and the movement that, you, that you're that you kind of um, generating between them. So as you said, there's no main character, there's no center to it. That's an immensely challenging thing to pull off as a writer. Um, what, what challenges did you encounter as you sort of embarked upon this book, which has no main character, which has no center? And how did you maintain the balance and the movement that we see. Um, well, for me, it's it like in trying to sum up the book as simple as possible. It's a book about friendship, mm -hmm. and I think that everyone knows what that feels like, whether it's with one person or with eight people like this group. And so, to try and pull it off was, to me at least, just to keep focusing on what it feels like to be, you know, experiencing friendship, um, and. So um, I guess we, you know, how do you, you know, like, how do you uh, weave together these different people's uh, personalities uh, while focusing on the fact that, like, what you're trying, what they're trying to get to is, is just, you know, this idealized friendship. And so it actually was interesting is that I think a lot of that, what you're talking about, uh, comes out, came out in the, edi in the editing. So I wrote this book, as I think, about uh, 40... 2,000 words, and I, the original draft uh, was uh, a lot longer, well, a lot longer, you know, maybe 15,000 words longer. I worked with my editor, who was very, uh, who I really loved working with, and with them, I cut the, we cut the text down to like 25,000 words, and then built it back very specifically about this idea of like, what do you give a person to make them a character? How much, you know, what is basically the bare minimum you can give so that the character is, uh, open to be filled by the reader. Um, and so for me, that was the, the way to do it, was to think about things that are always happening off stage, or um, to think about uh, you know, those moments where your friend has told you a really hard thing, and you're trying, to, you're trying to sympathize or give them good advice, but you're always bad at, you know, you could never give that advice to yourself, like you're always gonna fail to give that advice, where kind of this, you know, this idea of how do you, f you know, fill a person with what you believe is the best for them, and so I think that was the, be the that was the way that uh, the work I did with the editor was to um, really, you know, we went through it multiple times, taking away anything that could make you uh, believe that one character should act a certain way or should act a certain you know shouldn't act a certain way, um, and I think that 
that was you know that was really fun uh, in terms of like you know you, you dream of writing your book and then you don't think that much about like you know what the fifth draft is going to feel Amputating like. Amputating it. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and and that was really fun because that was uh, probably the most interesting part of it was to really try and uh, sp you know bring it down to its bare minimum and yet make it feel like you could be every single character in the book. And I'm. I promise I'm not just saying this because I want everyone to buy the book, even though I do want everyone to buy the book, but it really is striking, the sort of, the use of sparsity in this book. Um, you, s you show such restraint in the way that information is revealed. Um, we learn things very slowly, and because you're doing this technique of every paragraph is, we're switching perspectives constantly, so we start with Marie's perspective, and then suddenly, without even realizing it, we switch to Pierre's, and then suddenly it's Leia's, and um, as a result, you learn things very slowly, and you don't realize till the end of the book that you've already sort of learned everything. Um, what I think, what I see as the heart of the story is friendship, as you've said, but it's also storytelling and creation, um, because they're sat around the roundabout. They're sat around a table at a bar, around the roundabout, and they're always talking. It's so populated by dialogue, and it's so populated by these attempts to create themselves, to fictionalize themselves. And because we've already been talking about fiction and unreality, I'm hoping we could read a passage and then talk a bit more about how this dynamic arises in this friendship. So this is when Eli is telling his story. Um, so for context, Eli is um, one of the characters in this book. Tell us who Eli is while I find a page that uh, has been unmarked. <laughs> so, so for me, his, his name is Ellie, um, uh -huh. but there, there's no way to tell that, so my apologies. Um, uh, he is a character who is, uh, I would say, the most desirous of leaving the group. Uh, he dreams of uh, elsewhere, m m more you know, sexier friends, more fashion fashion scene friends going to better more and cooler bars where they dance more is uh, probably Ellie's the way to describe Ellie and and what is the story he's about to tell us um, he is uh, this is a story of uh, probably the most formative moment in his life that he is also hiding uh, and it's a story he tells often but is still full of uh, things he is hiding from his best friends Ellie, tell Nathan about the time you went to Dover. Matt rolled his eyes. Ellie noticed. Should I? Come on, please. It's so long, though, but it's such a good story. Tell it, allez. Ellie felt himself as the main character in his own fiction, and the telling felt good. He let himself be taken by the cool feeling of it running over his feet, climbing up his thighs. Outside, the air was hot, but the fiction was refreshing. All right, so... This happened in a February, Jesus, eight years ago now. So I decided to go backpacking around England to see castles and maybe see if English boys were anything like they pretended to be in stories. I was staying in London with a friend who'd moved there for university, and I was supposed to go north for a few days up to the Lake District. But the weather was really bad there, and I got an email from the hotel I'd booked staying, saying they decided to close because of the storm. So I looked for other places to visit. It was my first trip on my own, so it felt like it meant something. You know, like if I just stayed in London, I would have failed myself. Tu sais que je veux, que je veux dire? Oui, je comprends. The embellishment made space for Ellie to move around. He looked down on his fictional self as the fiction rushed in, and he made himself swim in the space that his telling created. He could feel the, fi the fiction rising over his back and taking over his neck. You have to understand that I studied English, that I was trained to become an English literature professor at the time, so everything was very Johnson and Dickens, if you know what I mean. Everything was very hardy. I didn't know where to go, and I stared out the window at the black clouds rolling in over London. They became my inspiration. Because of the storm, I got this idea to live out my Lear kink and go to Dover to throw myself from the cliffs in a fit of madness. What a romantic you are, Ellie. More like a dandy, more like a cad. You don't even know what a cad means. So I found some tickets for the bus for like 10 pounds and whatever, or whatever, and I found a hostel online that said it had space. I booked the bus and the hostel and went to the bus station, Victoria Station. It was 3 p.m. and the trip was supposed to take three hours with a stop in Canterbury. This story is so crazy, Nathan, you're not going to believe it. 
I'm just going to read a last little bit too. He said, Ellie felt the fiction pushing in through his nostrils, his eyes rolling back, the fiction taking control of him just like he'd intended. I mean, it's just, it's ex excellent writing. Um, it's, it's deeply erotic, and it's the sort of erotics of creation, right? The, the fact of fabricating a false self, someone that you're not, um, which is made all the more sexy when you're lying to your friends, inventing yourself in front of your friends. Um, and you've captured it so well, and so I was hoping you could speak to us more about how this dynamic of self-fictionalization emerges across the space of this book, not just with Ellie, but with everyone. Um, I mean, I think about that all the time. Like, we, you know, you, you have friends who you know for years, and, uh, you know, you hear them tell the same story over and over, and, and you think, like, you know, what is, you know, like, they, got, they have to know that we've heard this story, so they they're they're happy to just tell us the same story that we've already heard and uh and so yeah i think that's like that's where that maybe self fictionalization comes from it's it's um you know these this story is is probably at least you know at least the way i see it probably his most uh you know brutal shocking interesting like life you know life changing moment um he never tells the part that uh is m important to him uh, and also his friends throughout the telling of his story decide they don't believe him. It's the first time they really decide, like, this is not true. Um, and what's funny is that, like, there's one character, Matt, who's, uh, who just, he was kind of the, the leader in saying this isn't true, and he's somebody who is always lying to himself and is always, you know, kind of exists as that, that one friend who's always, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the guy who's always screwing up. He's the guy who doesn't have the good job. He's the guy who who, uh, you know, is definitely trying to exist with friends who are a bit, I think, always a bit more successful than he is. So the idea that he's trying to bring somebody down to fit within his fiction of himself. Um, and, yeah, I think that, you know, the, 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 you know, the thing I enjoyed about writing this is that, like, you know, it's, it's, it's that, you know, each person, e each person tells a, f a a part of the story, and it is slightly chr chronological, but uh, usually there's some things that contradict one another, like anybody's opinions do, and each character usually has some thing, and you're not exactly sure what, but something that is driving their, uh, their the desire to tell every story their own way, and usually it's something, uh, you know, awkward or erotic or or, uh, or or traumatic, and I think that like. That's the that's the hope is that you know we're all lying to each other. Maybe that's the we, the we is is a is a voice of a bunch of people who are all lying to each other. And I think that this this moment of Ellie telling the story is sort of the microcosm of the book itself because it's all of the friends working together to build the story, and it's repetitive. They've heard it before. They've been around the circle before, but but they have to return to it anyways. And the act of returning to it and repeating it is itself generative. Um, and I think something that you really touched upon that it is so central to this book is the idea that one's image of oneself is, is constructed by the way others see you. And so in this book, insofar as it's sort of um, framed by this these violent struggles for political recognition, there's a very vicious struggle for recognition on like a one-to-one -one level as well. These friends sitting around the table just constantly looking at one another and deciding who they are and interpreting one another. Um, and something striking about that is when we lose that as well. So I want to talk about Pierre and Sarah, who are two friends who are marked by their absence, largely. Um, and there's one moment where they're really missing the friend group, and they're in the forest, and it says, they both got quiet and looked around for eyes. Eyes were there watching, and Pierre and Sarah could see them, but the eyes were disappointing. So there's this need to perform and to be seen. Tell us about Pierre and Sarah um, and this larger impulse to look at one another and be seen. Um, so they're the friends who get the money from a grandparent and buy a house in the countryside. We all have them. <laughs> and they all, they kind of, from the first story, from the first story, which, you know, the, the book takes place kind of between, I would say this group's roughly 25 to 32 years old, and the first section is, is about 25, and, and uh, they've just moved, they've been there, you know, maybe six months, they're settling in, um, and they're there for a reason that we don't know. You know, that I don't think it's a very uh, you know dramatic reason. They've just decided they need to be out outside the city, 
Um, but their whole life is basically spent trying to determine if they have just enough time to make it to the train to get in <laughs> for the last call at the bar. They just never get on the train. Um, yeah, and they and you know they're always saying, okay, well we could do it and we would love to do it, but that means we have to sleep on our friend's couch and that sucks. So we're not going to do. You know, it's it's kind of a, a funny existence because they have all these beautiful things around them and they definitely are like take advantage of their beautiful things, but their beautiful things are always tinged with you know eyes or you know s you know um, dreaming of the city or dreaming of their friends all deciding to come out and live with them on their, you know, like hippie commune, uh, let's call it. And uh, and so I think that's like, they're those friends that they abandon everyone else with the hope that everyone would just we'll like come with them. And so, you know, they have the kind of selfish gene and they're, they're always debating how, how they could, you know, convince people to come and live outside Paris with them. And, and the further they get away, from the roundabout, the, the less contact they have with reality. So they start to build up this wild fantasy that they're going to build a hippie commune. Um, and they kind of picture their entire lives and the cabins they'll live in. And Pierre is going to go on a lake and go fishing, even though he's never fished uh, in his life. Um, and it's, yeah, they're excellent. I want, I realize that we're rapidly running out of time, uh, which I knew would happen. So I'm just going to close with, with one last question, um, maybe two. And then I'm going to turn to our in-person audience. So I want to talk about the the tragedy of this friend group too, which is the fact that they're stuck in this roundabout. They're aging uh, and they can't quite get out and they're, they're not quite happy, but they can't really go anywhere else. Uh, and you say at one point, or it's written in one point, they'd grown dull to the repetition, repetition of character, the sort of repetition of self-surrounding that makes the emotionally interested miss the truth. So is this a tragic book? Um. I was reading a lot of this. I wrote this during the first lockdown, and I was, you know, one of my first lockdown projects was read Greek tragedies. So maybe, uh, maybe there's something about it's that. It's it's tangible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't. I, I hope it's not a tragedy. I think like, you know, you know, in maybe a very cliche way, it's like the, you know, some of the most beautiful and, you know, things that are the best for your mental health are probably a bit sad, which would be to commit and to to you know to forgo the the imagined better for something you know is good and so i think that like yeah i mean i think it's it's it is tragic that uh, these people don't fully understand how good they've got it um this book I, I wrote this book after my very you know cool fun uh supportive friendship group in paris you know broke apart um, so it came, I think, from a place of like, like ah, oh, like it would be, wouldn't it be so good if that just could never happen to anyone? And so uh, I think that, yeah, I think that that um, that is, you know, that is what I hope to 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 show is that like, you know, maybe there is uh, that maybe you are less lonely than you think you are if you learn to look at your friends differently, if you learn to look at what you are given differently, or, you know, you learn your you. You count your blessings better, and maybe that's a book. You know, a book where, hopefully, a book where you can learn to, you know, see what you have in a in a more beautiful light. Can we have a round of applause?